I am Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. Welcome to this Farm Doc Daily Live Coronavirus and Ag webinar. Today, an update on policy and potential outlook for coronavirus pandemic relief. Jonathan Coppice from the Farm Doc team, University of Illinois College of Agricultural, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences is here and Brooke Appleton from the National Corn Growers Association also joins us. Just a quick view of what Brooke does. She's the Vice President of Public Policy at the National Corn Growers Association in Washington, D.C. Brooke, thank you so much for being with us today. Can you tell me a little bit about your position and then take us through your slide set? Sure, that'd be great. Thanks so much, Todd, for having me. And thank you to the University of Illinois and the Illinois Corn Growers for, for giving me this opportunity today. Um, just real quickly on me, I grew up in Northwest Missouri on a row crop and beef cattle farm, uh, attended the University of Missouri where I received my degree in agribusiness. And I've spent the last 14 years uh, in Washington working on in ag policy, including some time on Capitol Hill and at the Department of Agriculture. Um, my current role at NCGA, I oversee and manage our Washington DC office where we have six full-time lobbyists that advocate for corn farmers on a broad group of issues. Uh, on anything from transportation to crop protection to risk management, biofuels, and everything in between. So that's just kind of a brief brief overview of, of the team here in Washington. And if you would like, yep, we'll get started here. Um, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to unfold across both urban and rural America, you know, NCGA is really trying to do our part in continuing to learn how this outbreak impacts the American corn farmer. We're looking at how to manage those impacts and how we can address the large degree of uncertainty it creates for the future. Today, I'm going to go over what current policies are in place to help corn farmers to manage risk, then cover the initial analysis we have on the immediate price effects we're seeing from COVID-19 on corn for the 2019 crop. And then I'll end my portion of the presentation discussing the federal aid packages and what we expect next from Congress. As you all know, uh, farmers are no stranger to uncertainty, uh, dealing with unpredictable variables, including weather, international trade dynamics, and global economic challenges, but yet our farmers continue to feed and fuel the world. This current pandemic represents just another, you know, yet another level of unpredictability that we're all working through. NCGA, along with its state associations, have been longtime champions for building and protecting a safety net for uncontrollable circumstances such as these. I'd like to touch on a few of the existing farm and risk management programs in place. While, of course, not intended to make a producer whole, these programs help farmers to continue to operate in uncertain times and ensure that they can continue operating into the future. On ARC and the PLC programs, which were of course created in the 2014 Farm Bill and expanded upon in the 2018 Farm Bill, were, these programs were designed to provide the front line of financial defense for producers as revenues or prices fall. For 2019-2020, uh, calculators from the University of Illinois and also from Texas A&M generally recommended that most producers take PLC for corn acres. Uh, what we're seeing is if corn prices stay at their current lows for the rest of the marketing year, then analysis shows that that PLC uh, will, will generate a corn payment of $17 an acre for the 2019 crop. Now, if prices should increase, then no payment will be generated, which would be a positive sign that corn prices are recovering and the safety net PLC program is working exactly as it is intended to. While the ARC program is unlikely to pay out for the 2019 crop year, producers in this program will be protected against revenue losses for their 2020 crop, particularly if low prices persist for an extended period of time or yields unexpectedly decline. As for the crop insurance program, current projections indicate that it is unlikely a payment will be generated under the widely used 85% revenue protection policies for corn, which was actually reported in the March 24th Farm Doc Daily Report. Thank you for that. However, uh, crop insurance will be a key, will be key to managing the uncertainty created by COVID-19. If yields decline due to unexpected weather or prices continue to fall as, as the result of our, this economic downturn, then crop insurance support may kick in to manage the damage to producers. 
You know, NCGA takes a lot of pride uh, in the work done over the over the past couple of decades to improve the crop insurance program, and we have confidence in its ability to protect farmers against financial uncertainty. I'd like to also mention, uh, you know, access to capital, which is always an important tool for, for farmers to have. Adequate cash flows are key for farmers to continue operating their business, uh, especially when prices are low and the future is uncertain. The FSA operates as a lender of last resort, providing a variety of programs and opportunities for producers that have limited resources available through traditional lending institutions. There are a wide variety of credit programs that NCGA has been uh, very supportive of over the years, already in, existence, already in existence at USDA. You couple that with the COVID-19 specific support for farmers at the department, and we believe farmers will continue to have access to the capital that they need. USDA has also announced in the last couple of weeks that they're providing some flexibilities in these loan programs such as extending marketing assistant loan terms to 12 months and also providing flexibilities in loan deadlines. Lastly, I wanted to mention, you know, our work on trade policy plays an important role in securing market markets for corn and corn products. With our two largest demand markets, livestock feed and ethanol, currently under extreme stresses due to the pandemic, our international markets are more important than ever. Luckily, international trade has continued need to flow, and we will continue to work with our industry partners to prevent, to prevent disruption in the markets. We will also continue to enforce in existing trade agreements while aggressively pursuing new market opportunities. So I just thought it was important to, to start out with the current policies in place as NCGA has spent years developing and protecting an effective risk management system for corn farmers. A strong farm safety net Partnerships with our key customer industries and an aggressive international trade strategy creates a stable foundation in a time when so many are facing total uncertainty. Now kind of shifting gears and taking a look, a look at the current issue at hand, it was important to NCGA to get a good handle on what effects COVID is having directly on the corn industry. It has served us well over the years to have good analysis to back up any policy ask in Washington. With a focus on current damage, we asked IFAR to pre prepare an analysis on the price decline for corn since the pandemic hit. That analysis showed a 16 to 20 percent on average price decline for corn and a $50 per acre revenue decline. Additionally, the anal analysis projects a $17 per acre PLC payment for the 2019 crop but we keep in mind there that the PLC program only pays out on base acres. It's important to stress that these are estimates for the 2019 crop only, and we could of course see these losses increase as we continue through the marketing year. I thought it was important to highlight that analysis before talking about the USDA aid package that was announced last Friday because we think that the analysis complements their package nicely, showing the significant price decline for corn. A quick run through of what's in the aid package for corn farmers, and I know Jonathan is gonna talk about this in more depth later. But in the full $19 billion package, $16 billion of that was made available for direct payments for producers, including 3.9 billion for row crop producers. Producers will receive a single payment determined using two calculations, uh, the first being price losses that occurred January 1 through April 15th of 2020. Producers will be compensated for 85% of price loss during that period. The second part of the payment will be expected losses from April 15th through the next two quarters and will cover 30% of expected losses. The last kind of eligibility piece of the program are that qualified commodities must have experienced a 5% price decrease between January 1 and April 15th, which, as I mentioned earlier, won't be an issue for corn as our losses are, are showing anywhere between 16 and 20% during that time frame. We still have some outstanding questions on eligibility for this direct payment program and on what methodology USDA will use to set the price per commodity. Uh, you know, we're not sure how the, how the 3.9 billion will break down between commodities. 
We're not sure what the formula looks like for determining losses. These are just some of the questions that we kind of have uh, around the program. But, you know, the program is subject to the rulemaking process, and we expect to see some of these details coming in the next couple of weeks once the rule is complete and before sign-up begins. In the meantime, we will continue to flag concerns and questions to USDA from our farmers. Also on this side, on this slide, you'll see the amounts of money that are going directly to livestock producers. Uh, you know, a healthy livestock industry is also important to corn farmers as they are our biggest customer. So we are pleased to see direct aid for those producers as well. Just a couple of things, a few other programs made available to farmers through the, through the CARES Act are two programs administered by the Small Business Administration, the Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, or PPP and EIDL, as we, of course, have an acronym for everything in Washington. Uh, PPP is a loan program that is designed for businesses to keep their workforce employed during the COVID crisis, and EIDL is a loan advance to provide up to $10,000 of economic relief to businesses that are currently experiencing temporary difficulties due to the crisis. We've been closely tracking these programs, which are newly available to our farmers, encouraging farmers to reach out to their lenders for more information on eligibility to see if they are viable options for them. For them. I'm going to end talking a little bit about action that we've seen in Congress and kind of what our perspectives are on next steps. In, in just the last four weeks, Congress has passed almost $3 trillion in aid for the American people. And just this week, they passed another package of $484 billion, which included additional money for both the PPP and the EIDL, EIDL programs that I just mentioned. That was two things that NCGA had advocated for. There was also more money made available for hospitals and COVID testing in the package passed yesterday. Uh, this is unprecedented amounts of money going out the door in a short period of time. And, you know, discussions on a fourth, more comprehensive stimulus package are currently underway. I believe for agriculture, the, the big debate will be, um, you know, I think the big debate in agriculture will be, you know, how to structure providing more aid for the industry moving forward. You know, some people are going to look to getting more CCC funds for USDA. Others are going to prefer more direct funding since, uh, direct funding for the department since uh, they are restricted They're on how they can spend CCC funds. You know, the CARES Act had a combination of the two. It provided $14 billion to replenish the CCC, and it also directly appropriated $9.5 billion for the Office of the Secretary. So I think on top of, on top of how, on top of those two things, the other sticking points, I believe, will be um, how Congress comes to an agreement on increased SNAP funding, and if they can coalesce around providing direct funding for the ethanol industry. I think for us, those are kind of the three buckets where we're going to see the most debate over the course of the next, you know, two to four weeks. Timing on a fourth package is unclear. Congress is currently scheduled to come back into session on May 4th, but I wouldn't be surprised if that date slips to later in the month especially with the D.C. sheltering in place policy uh, in place until May 15th. That being said, again, I don't think we'll see action on a fourth package until later in May or possibly into June. But I always caveat that with, um, you know, that can change at any given moment uh, should, should Congress need to move something quickly as they did this week. Lastly, I just want to end with you know, keeping growers safe and their farms operational remains our focus. And we uh, remains our focus, and we've created a variety of tips designed to help growers manage COVID on their farms, as well as a number of documents laying out current policies and information based on uh, COVID relief. All of these resources you can find on our website, and we have a COVID nineteen landing page that you can um, that you can reach at ncga.com slash COVID-19. And with that, I will, I will just say, again, thank you so much for the opportunity today, and I look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Brooke. Brooke Appleton, of course, is the Vice President of Public Policy at the National Corn Growers Association. 
Hi, Jonathan. Jonathan, of course, is with the Farm Doc Daily team here on uh, the College of Agricultural, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences, University of Illinois uh, campus, and a policy specialist. I bet you have been busy just following what's happening in Washington, D.C., and trying to get a handle on what it all means down on the farm. Thanks, Jonathan, uh, for spending, uh, I suspect, an over uh, overly great amount of time trying to get it all situated in your mind. I appreciate that. Why don't you take us through your slides? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Todd. And uh, I want to add my appreciation to Brooke for uh, taking time this morning to uh, to join this webinar. That was fantastic. So I'm going to just kind of uh, jump off from a few points that she made, and then we'll dive into a couple other issues. Um, the USDA announced package that, that Brooke mentioned, about $19 billion uh, announced. This is the breakdown, um, including the specialty crop, row crop, hog, dairy, and cattle funding uh, amounts that she talked about. And then, of course, uh, some additional assistance announced by USDA for purchase and distribution of foods uh, to help those who are struggling to get uh, food on the table. And if we look at this overall $19 billion, uh, something I'm going to come back to in a little bit is just sorting out some of the questions we have around priorities and, and how best uh, for USDA to get creative in this in this pandemic crisis. And, you know, it's it's it jumps out that about 80 percent of the funds uh, being used in this most recent package go to producers and about you know 20 percent to uh, to consumers. And so we want to sort of ask questions and think through a few things there. Um, Again, not to not to pick fights or anything, but just just trying to think through how best we we deal with this situation. If you jump to the next slide, please. Um, I'm actually going to uh, uh, tap in for a bit of uh, middle relief here uh, with Nick Paulson, who worked on uh, reviewing some of the prices and some of the other background information. So, if Nick, you want to uh, jump in, uh, you'll notice on the slide in front of you the futures price changes, as well as something that, that backs up what Brooke was mentioning, which is the uh, the assistance that have, that has gone out uh, thus far uh, to farmers uh, of the row crops, including ARC PLC and crop insurance and MFP. Uh, but Nick, you want to take away the uh, take away the discussion on sure. futures prices here? Sure. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start end and maybe sprinkle in between a, a disclaimer that that some of the the numbers I'm gonna talk about here and in, in uh, us trying to speculate and anticipate how how that row crop. Uh, a portion of the of the of the funds might be allocated across crops. Uh, the 3.9 billion. Um, the the chart you see on on the left there is looking at um, percentage changes in some of the uh, futures contracts that we saw during that January uh, to April 15th time period that that USDA has indicated that they'll be looking at um, price changes to 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 estimate losses and, and payment levels in some way. Um, and kind of regardless of the contracts you look at, you know, May and July would be old crop contracts for uh, for, for most of those crops. Uh, wheat, I guess, July would would technically be getting into new crop territory. And then the September and, and November, December contracts, depending on the commodity, would be would be 2020 or new crop contracts. But you know, pretty pretty similar story across the board here, with regardless of which contract you're looking at. Um, cotton looking at losses um, in the you know, exceeding 20%, upwards of 25, 26%. Uh, corn in that in that 15 to 20% range that that Brooke had mentioned. Uh, soybeans average average around those four contracts of about a 13% loss. And then wheat is is kind of the interesting one that, that remains a question. Is you know they don't uh, regardless of whether you look at the Kansas City uh, hard red winter. Or Chicago soft red winter wheat contracts are looking at less than a five percent decline there. So, questionable about questionable about whether wheat uh, may even qualify for for a portion of the of the three point nine billion in this in, in this program. Um, if we go ahead to the next slide. Um, again, this is my I'm gonna I'm gonna get into my disclaimer here on on some of these numbers I'm gonna talk about. Um, so the chart on the left is. Uh, uh, ERS information, information provided by USDA, uh, uh, the Economic Research Service of the USDA, that just shows uh, historical averages of kind of how the, the the crops are are marketed throughout their individual marketing year. So for wheat, we go from uh, June through May. Corn and soybeans are, are September through August, and the cotton marketing year is August through um, July. Um, so if we if we kind of think about 
this first round of funding potentially being focused on losses experienced related to old crop or 2019 crop. Um, we might think about how USDA could um, focus losses associated with, with the portions of the crop yet to be marketed as of uh, the 2020 calendar year. Um, and so if we look at the, the full January through August timeframe here, you know, a significant portion of the corn crop is, is marketed um, in the calendar year following uh, when, it's, when it's grown and harvested, uh, you know, close to half of the soybean crop, about half of the cotton crop and, and a little and about 27 percent of wheat. If we look at, you know, a period that may be more concentrated on uh, the time period where the COVID effects have, have created some of those price losses, uh, you know, even from, from March to the end of the marking year, we're looking at 40% of the corn is typically marketed at this time, about a quarter of the soybeans. Um, and then, uh, you know, 13, 14% of the wheat and about 21% of the cotton. So if we, you know, did kind of a, a calculation in terms of taking those futures price declines, applying them to the cash prices we saw for these crops in January, um, and then, you know, accounting for the portions of these crops that are, that are marketed during this, this time frame here since January, you know, if we were directly measuring losses, we'd be looking at, you know, numbers around $6 billion for corn, uh, $2 billion for soybean, $750 million for cotton. Now, again, we can, we can argue about how much of that is, is COVID related versus other factors, you know, whether it's the full January to August time frame or, or something shorter than that, but these are kind of maybe top end estimates, uh, rough estimates for the, for the damages that these, these crops may have experienced on the price side, just, um, just in, in, in 2020 for the, for the 2019 crop. Um, this, this next slide, again, I'm going to interject my disclaimer, at least one more time. These are, these are rough estimates. I have no inside information about how USDA will actually calculate damages and allocate payments. This is just, uh, a potential way they could do it based on the information we have now with the 85% and 30% uh, two-phase calculation. I, I personally just chose to apply that to a couple different time periods in that, um, in this kind of back end of the 2019 marketing year, um, you know, looking at covering the months of, of February through August in, in two phases. You know, we're looking at potentially, uh, again, payments I'm in the neighborhood of you know exceeding two two and a half billion dollars for corn, uh, eight hundred plus million for soybeans, three hundred plus million for cotton, which would only leave only leave uh, you know one hundred and fifty million dollars for some of the others. Um, again, this is a very speculative approach to thinking about how this three point nine billion billion might be allocated. Um, there's different ways that USDA might have to apply you know haircuts to um, to some of these numbers to make some other crops fit in here. Uh, but again, based on the, the time period and the price losses experienced during that time period, I'm, I, I feel like these are you know, decent estimates for thinking about how that $3.9 billion might be, might be allocated. But I totally reserve the right to be completely off base on that. Um, and again, that's, that's based on nothing I've learned from USDA uh, that, that the rest of us wouldn't know already. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Jonathan. Thanks, Nick. Um, so that's a fantastic sort of dive into just the difficulties of sorting out this payment structure and, and how to address losses uh, given the situation and the time frame. The other thing, uh, and we're writing this up in a Farm Doc Daily article that will come out today discussing just what Nick went through, but also this sort of question about priorities at the moment um, in this pandemic and this, you know, the purchase versus payment kind of situation given what is such a unique scenario. Um, you know, Brooke and I both talked about existing programs like crop insurance and ARC and PLC that make payments and sort of traditionally built around the risk structures for farming. Um, but something like this pandemic where we were all sheltering at home and restaurants and schools are closed and on and on and on kind of just upends the situation. I think highlighting that is just what we've seen reported in the last five weeks. About 26 million Americans have filed jobless claims, and you can see that massive increase uh, in the last five weeks of the number of people that have filed uh, claims, just unprecedented levels of joblessness. And upwards of 16 million now as of last week um, on the unemployment insurance program. So it, we're, we're talking about a, 
a level of challenge out there uh, for people who lose their jobs and their ability just to manage the day-to-day -day issues in their homes, to put food on the table and whatnot. It really, really highlights the need for thinking through uh, some of the, the abilities to help, to help particularly in the short term. You notice on the on the one side here, just some of what the Food Nutrition Service does uh, in this regard. So it's a reminder of just how uh, how much effort does go through USDA to help people put food on the table, whether it's a supplemental nutrition assistance program, the women, infant, and children program, or so forth. And these are the, the most recently reported. So none of this has had the COVID impact yet. This is from January before everything, before all the shutdowns happened and the shelters in place. So you can see the kind of level of, uh, of funding that, that went out then. We expect this to grow quite a bit just based on the fact that these are counter, most of these are counter cyclical based programs. So the more people go uh, on unemployment, the more they lose their jobs, the more they're gonna qualify for the programs. Can you skip ahead, please. Um, one of the things we wanted to think about, and this is, why, this is where this sort of uh, question about you know, the priorities around payments or purchases. We use the CCC to make payments under the congressional programs like ARC and PLC. USDA has gotten creative to use the CCC funds for uh, the MFP program. It's used for marketing loans, it's used for conservation and so forth. But it's also important to remember in this discussion that the Commodity Credit Corporation can do more than make payments. In fact, uh, it has probably even more flexibility in terms of purchasing and procurement than even making payments. And so Section 5C, for example, of its standing authorities, its general uh, specific powers, uh, allows for the procurement of agricultural commodities to provide for relief and meet domestic needs. So it, this is an incredible authority. It's run by FSA, and FSA has a great logistical operation to move uh, commodities around, to store them and get them uh, donated to food banks and other places for relief efforts. The concern I have, and why one of the questions about priorities comes up, is that we do have a limited cap of $30 billion of, uh, of the line of credit for the CCC. So every, every dollar spent on payments or otherwise obligated can't be used for procurement. <clears throat> and that $14 billion reimbursement, as I understand it, actually doesn't kick in until about late June or July. And so given the, the if what, what we hope, hope, hope is the depths of this situation, um, I sort of offer up as a as a thing to think about is whether we should be uh, reallocating priorities around getting getting food purchased and distributed uh, with what's remaining in the CCC account or until it's refilled. Skip it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jump to the next one, please. The other thing to note, uh, in addition to the CCC account, there's something called the Section 32 account, which was created all the way back in the Great Depression, uh, 1935. And this is a permanent appropriation for USDA. It's based on 30% of custom receipts. And what this does is give USDA further funding and authority to purchase and donate commodities. And what I think is interesting, if you look at the uh, reported numbers by USDA and its fiscal 2021 budget, we're seeing an increase uh, in this uh, Section 32 funding that is available to USDA. And some of the $19 billion announcement they made uh, includes the use of Section 32. But here again, uh, if we're calling out uh, a time for creative efforts, creative efforts to move food, uh, particularly where we have food at risk of being wasted uh, or lost, things, the stories are just, are just tough to stomach, that the, the producers are dumping milk on the ground because they can't get it through the supply chain, that everything from fresh fruits and vegetables, plowing under lettuce or losing strawberries, like these things just sort of hit you as, as, as really uh, lost. Um, any time, but certainly at a time of, of this crisis and pandemic. And so to the extent USDA can really focus on getting creative to, to move these products and distribute them. And one of the things that hit me, you know, as you sort of struggle through this, and Todd, you sort of joke about, I probably follow this stuff too much, but I, I read a story the other day that really kind of, uh, you know, sparked uh, some of my thinking around this. And this is a story about how some of the schools who are now not feeding students through the school lunch programs and who are obviously closed down as well, have turned themselves into community relief organizations and are trying to move food through. But many of them uh, are also helping adults in the situation. And um, because it's for school lunches may not get reimbursed under existing regulations. So it hit me that if we're gonna raise questions about you know, how we prioritize purchases and payments and, at the time, and the timing of those priorities. Also, you know, USD has been very creative in making payments 
can we see that same level of creativity around purchases and distribution? And maybe, just maybe, and I, you know, this is something that has to be worked out, but given the, the, the footprint of our public school systems and our schools and our communities from, from the inner city urban areas to the most rural remote areas, we've got schools. Um, this is a program that has the ability to feed millions um, and 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 has a significant footprint that's that's a bit un, that's going unused in many cases right now. So can we get that kind of creativity and prioritize getting food into the hands of some of these 20, as many of these 26 million uh, unemployed Americans and people who are struggling to help feed their families in a health crisis and a pandemic? And so, again, not to provoke. Um, uh, pick a fight, but to provoke some thinking and creativity around how we prioritize the uses of the authorities and the and the limited resources and and staff and and facilities at USDA to get the most help to the most people as quickly as possible. And so I just sort of uh, uh, kind of highlight what might be some potentials uh, that USDA has. We've mentioned in the past the, the Defense Production Act capabilities at USDA to really prioritize and allocate food, and so. Here again, um, thinking this through uh, as we think about everything from uh, using purchase and, 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 and capabilities from, from even the ethanol sector struggling with, with what is going through, the potential markets that market hits that Nick had talked about that may even be exacerbated if uh, things like the RFS waivers from some of the governors uh, come to pass. You know, we're going to see on and on a, a series of problems. So how do we prioritize what we do in the near term versus coming back later to look for payments? And that's kind of the argument we've got in a farm doc article coming out today and just something that I sort of pose into the, uh, the greater ether of the discussion around policy and, and response. And I think with that, we've, uh, we've run through our material and are happy to, uh, to take questions. Uh, Todd, I'll hand it back over to you to once again, thank our incredible sponsors and supporters uh, for the efforts here at farm doc. Yeah, thank you so very much, Jonathan. This is made possible in part by the folks at TIA, the Center for Farmland Research that's here on campus in the College of Agricultural, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences. You can find it at farmland.illinois.edu. Compere Financial has helped out Farm Credit Illinois, Growmark, the Illinois Corn Growers Association, as well as, of course, the Department of Agricultural and Consumer Economics, to which most of the Farm Doc team, actually all of the Farm Doc team belongs. Coming up, just a couple of webinars and write some question outs, uh, questions out. There are a whole bunch of them already, uh, but write questions out if you have them. Coming up uh, on Tuesday, Nick Paulson and Joe Glauber will be here to talk about ag trade. Should be a very good webinar. Again, these all happen at 11 o'clock and then Friday, central time that is, and then Friday of next week, the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on livestock markets. I know everybody's going to want to try to join that one as well. So let's go through through some of the questions. Uh, I think we'll start uh, with this question. Recognizing the formula for payments is really uncertain at this point, um, but that there is a reference to covering losses on crops inventory not already hedged and priced. Um, this has been talked about, and I get asked this question by farmers a lot. Uh, th this person's not sure that it's feasible to implement a, a, a payout from that $16 billion that would include money for crops that aren't more money for crops that are not marketed and have taken a stiffer loss than those that have. Do either uh, of you, Nick or uh, Jonathan or, or uh, um, our, our folks at the NCGA have an answer for this question? Is it possible to do it that way? We get this question all the time. I don't know, Jonathan. You have anything to say on that, or <laughs> I mean, I, I could, I could talk. But. Yeah, I mean, go ahead. You've, 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 you've run through some of those numbers a lot closer than I have. So maybe your initial th thought on that, and I can follow up. Yeah, no, I mean, this is a key kind of uh, detail uh, when you start taking a look at, you know, again, the the speculative way that we looked at uh, maybe targeting losses towards the unmarketed portion of the crop and. And the, those ERS numbers that I discussed, the uh, you know the percent marketed by month throughout the marketing year, that that doesn't necessarily mean that that crop wasn't priced ahead of time. So there's you know, obviously a difference between a, a farmer who's delivering corn in 
in uh, who delivered or will be delivering corn here in the in the last month or the next month that that had forward contracted it back even ahead of harvest uh, versus someone who is you know delivering to the spot market. Um, and you know, I think there are feasible ways to uh, collect records that could could verify those sorts of things and maybe differentiate payments. Um, but at, you know, at that point, it becomes a trade off of you know the cost to administer uh, the program and, and the speed at which they can get support out if, if, if that is a priority. So um, that's the that's the the vague non answer, I guess I would I would get on that one. <laughs> the only thing I'd add is I think it just highlights that from the priorities and uh, standpoint that I, th I agree with Nick. I mean, there's a lot of data that USDA has that we don't have our hands on and a lot of information they can work through and, and a lot of automated aspects with FSA anymore and getting payments out. The challenge is probably just trying to address the uh, such an uncertainty around the losses, which I, like I said, goes to this priority question. Do we need to be doing this particular payment system right now or you know, our traditional payments follow uh, much follow the losses typically, and um, whether we should be refocusing some of these limited funds and resources on on this idea of getting purchased food distributed out to people that are in need. So it, I'm sure they can come up with. I, I have a hard time imagining they announced a program that they haven't figured out how to calculate yet, and that a lot of what we're a lot of the uncertainty that we have is just the the the, the process of by which they have to go through to get it. Um, up and running, but it does highlight sort of these questions around timing. Jonathan, there was a question, uh, and this is a clarification point uh, about the CCC funding. Uh, that $14 billion was in the CARES Act. The question is how much of that is actually available because it says replenish. So yeah. do we know what that means? Uh, I, I asked this question directly of USDA and well, you saw the answer. I'm not sure that it gave me an answer, frankly. But uh, well, I you... think I mean again here, this USDA could help us all out by being a little more straightforward about what the status of the CCC line of credit is. Um, I think I've gone back over that language more times than sanity should should dic uh, counsel dictate. But the the best way I can understand it is you got 14 billion in reimbursement for for realized losses for already spent money. But it reads in that appropriated language like it doesn't kick in until after a report they're required to file uh, in June, in which case that doesn't it would mean it would indicate that 14 billion reimbursement has not applied to the account now, which means it didn't free up that fund that amount of funding right now. I'm I'm happy to be proved wrong or to be told I'm wrong on that one. I that's my best read of it and understanding of that and some of the answers you've gotten and some of the other information and discussions I've been. Uh, uh, a, a part of, but it seems like we're we're at a much lower level funding available under that line of credit, which may be why there's only 3.9 in the row crop fund of this $19 billion announcement too, that it may be an indicator about how close we are to that, that cap. I, I don't know for certain. Uh, again, USDA could clear this up and get us some, some more details on where the CCC accounts stand. But right now, my read is that that reimbursement doesn't kick in until this summer. So here's a question about ARC PLC and the decisions producers have made already. Uh, for instance, last year, it was possible to change your decision still. Um, by the time we got to uh, June and July, uh, they want to know whether you can change your ARC PLC decision in this marketing or for this crop year. Uh, Brooke might know whether this is in any of the discussions. My understanding of this is that it's it, it, the decision is currently locked for the 19 and 20 crop years, and I have not seen anything where USDA has announced that, and I don't know, but, but what Congress might have to free that up because that is in the Farm Bill statute, um, whether they've announced any flexibility around that. I also haven't seen numbers, and again, Brooke, you might have some more of this on, on who signed up for which program. Uh, but you know, we 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 were estimating that the bulk of the corn farmers would be in PLC based on where prices were, and that it was kind of a 50-50 shot on soybeans, uh, uh, and that was pre-COVID. So I I don't know, um, and Brooke, I hate to put you on the spot, but if you had any any further knowledge or information on that, uh, my read is that they probably got to get Congress to at least provide that flexibility in an upcoming bill. Yeah, there would need to be a legislative a legislative fix there. Um, there really hasn't been a lot of discussion around uh, extending 
uh, or reopening that ARC and PLC um, uh, application process. But what we did see in the dairy sector is they asked for their for their program, the, the margin protection program, to be reopened, and the secretary um, ha said that he, he didn't plan on doing that. So that would indicate to me that that, that probably isn't a, a viable uh, uh, option right now as far as reopening ARC and PLC. Um, you know, that deadline for the 2019 crop was about a month ago. So um, farmers had a, a very long time period to sign up. I understand a lot has changed in that month. Um, but they're they're already looking to take uh, uh, the allocations for the 2020 crop as well. Brooke, somebody wants to know what market opportunities NCGA has been investigating uh, because the ethanol side, of course, is uh, sliding desperately at this point, uh, as is the supply chain issues with the uh, meat red meat market. So what other things are possible? Yeah, we're always very aggressive in our <laughs> in our uh, march for more market demand and for more uh, policies, uh, international trade policies to sell more to sell more ethanol. It, you know, the issue we're seeing right now um, in the ethanol sector is kind of twofold, if you will. I mean, we we're seeing over a fifty percent drop in demand for gasoline due to the current COVID situation and the lack of travel. And then also compounding on top of that is the is the bigger issue, the kind of more encompassing issue of of the, the Saudi Arabia Russia battle on oil production. So, um, you know, we we are constantly thinking and working through how we can pull in new markets. You know, we've had really good discussions in a number of countries over the past years uh, looking for more markets for ethanol. But right now, I think unfortunately, this demand situation is really what is is driving down uh, driving down the ethanol demand as it is as it is for gasoline as well. Will China you know, through phase one bring go on? I was just gonna I was just gonna follow up on that because I think that Brooke makes a great point about what the the hit, the hits the ethanol industry are taking into this idea of new markets. And here's one of those examples. And you've heard some anecdotal evidence about the ability to create like hand sanitizers or other sanitization um, because it is an alcohol that we're that that's being produced in the ethanol plants. And I realize there's a lot of retooling. But it's a reminder of just how important assistance to the ethanol industry is because this is a domestic production capability and domestic jobs that helping that out keeps a, a production capacity on hand that we might be able to use even in some new opportunities we're not necessarily thinking of, of right yet. So I, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly all that's going on in that in that space to, to look at re, refiguring or retooling some of these, but it is an important capacity and another reminder of where we need to be focusing our priority of, of assistance. Jonathan, can CCC opinion. funds be used for the ethanol industry? I would argue that they can be uh, based on Section 5E and the fact that uh, the pre that uh, uh, back in 2015, I think it was, they created uh, some blender pump uh, funding that went out to the states. Now there was some controversy around that, of course, but they did provide. They did find uh, authority to use CCC to help with uh, expanding. Uh, I think it was blender pumps and E15 capacity. So I would argue uh, you can you can make a strong argument for it under the the specific authorities, and that argument would be strengthened by the situation that we find ourselves in now. Because again, losing that ethanol production capacity really makes me nervous. Jonathan and Nick, did your aid calculations on the slides take into account the uh, $250,000 cap on payments per producer? It's $125,000, uh, no. but no, right, Nick? Yeah, Sorry. yeah, yeah, two fifty. No, uh, so I mean that would that could you know I would in my opinion marginally reduce the the outlays required for again the payment system I came up with. It's 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 not a, any anything close to an official thing that USDA might might announce, but um, no, no explicit inclusion of um, any payment limit effects there. What would the uh, be the result of no payment limits on USDA sixteen billion dollars of cash payments to farmers and ranchers? Somebody wants to know. I mean, I that's one of the that is a tough question because um, I mean farmers on the row crop side the 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 payment limit they've they've dealt with that. I mean, the payment limits under MFP 19 were a little higher, but or higher, but so that doesn't impact. I, I think we're going to run into some challenges around um, the livestock 
uh, assistance and the specialty crop assistance, particularly when you think about some of the size of some of those operations and some of the specialty crops out in California, you got big, high value crops that uh, that are taking hits. So I, I don't know. I, the general thing is, I guess, if you if you just do the zero sum aspect of this, there's a limited amount of money available, what 2.1, for example, on specialty crops. So the payment limit does at least equalize some level of support. If you had a bunch of, uh, if you had a few that took in on a lot more than that, it obviously could limit the ability for some of the smaller producers, but some of that's gonna depend, you know, that may be very different situation for hogs than for cattle, for example. So I think it's probably one of those things they're gonna have to sort out, but I think in general, given a limited amount of money, uh, the more that any one, uh, or few take up, the less there is for everybody else. Uh, so that could be one of the challenges. Hey, Spencer, if you could put your question back in. I deleted it and didn't read it a second time fast enough. Uh, question um, on on the livestock industry, in particular in the hogs, because there clearly is a supply chain issue there. What's uh, your view of the impact of this uh, at this point over the long term or short term either one on corn growers and i guess brooke we'll start with you have you all had discussions about what this means for feed usage yes we've had a lot of discussion around this issue and i think we're you know we're all um you, we're all questioning exactly what those longer term effects are i think from the beginning of all of this we've we've thought from a corn perspective that we're definitely going to see some immediate impacts but we think that the longer we're, def we're, we're going to see more impacts later and in the more longer term. And I think this pork situation is one of them. Um, I know every, you know, every state association that, that we have has brought up uh, similar uh, pork related issues in their state. So it's definitely on our radar as far as how that looks and, and what that means for the supply chain moving forward. I think that's yet to be seen and determined, but um, can't imagine it's going to be uh, a, a positive outcome, at least at this point in time, until we can get some of these plants back up and running at full capacity. So you have all done a lot of speculation about what these the 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 structure of these USDA programs will look like on the payments side. Anybody have an insight on when USDA might offer some actual details? I do not. Uh, know. We'll take that. Oh in. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I mentioned in, in my presentation, you know, in our discussions with the department, we, we believe they're, they're working to get this thing done as quickly as possible and, and hoping to see something in the coming weeks from them, uh, understanding that the rulemaking process has to take place and, and you know, that takes some time. So, um, uh, that's, been, that's been kind of our, our discussions to this point anyway. Jonathan, you mentioned the several programs already in legislation, Defense Production Act, Section 32, and the CCC Authority. Should we focus on those programs, this person asked, rather than develop a new policy, especially in the current political environment? <laughs> I mean, I think uh, it, when you're in the middle of something like this, again, 26 million people have filed for jobless claims. Like, I... I think you look at every authority you've got in front of you and and work. Obviously, you got to stay within the bounds of what the statutes say, but certainly look for every creative opportunity to uh, to maximize the usage of that authority to get food to people who need it. Uh, and then where you stumble or where you where you got roadblocks, um, you know, as Brooke mentioned, Congress is going to come back in and, and look at a fourth or fifth round, which 3.5, 4.5, whatever it is. To look at the this ver another version of relief, and that's when you set up and say, "Look, we need some uh, emergency uh, capability to move around this roadblock, or to really get creative around this." But I think um, I think there's a substantial amount of capability at USDA, a substantial amount of authority, and uh, you know, my sort of uh, plug is that let's get creative, let's get people food. Hey, Nick, I sent an email off to both Dale Latz and Bob Ray on this question, but haven't seen anything back from them just yet. Any new directives from SBA on how the PPP, on PPP using Schedule F at all? Uh, not that I've seen, and I, I kind of passively, passively follow the email list those guys right. are on. Yeah, that's, that's why I, that I sent that question off to them. Maybe, maybe it'll come back up, so we'll see whether we can find that yeah, question. My 
my guess is if they haven't responded, maybe they're maybe they're working through new guidance or but no, I, I have not I have not heard of any any new more helpful guidance from SBA on how you know Schedule F filers or whether or not they're eligible or not or things like that. I know are some of the questions. Well, Todd, just just to follow up on that, I think Brooke highlighted this that this this package that went through or that is on the president's desk now that just went through Congress did clarify that aspect to make sure farmers could be eligible. So it, it SBA probably hasn't issued anything yet if it hadn't been signed, but I, I do think that that should give, I don't know that it specifically mentioned schedule F um, and I can look into that as well, but I, I do know that, that the news reports were that they had uh, kind of highlighted that to make eligibility or expand eligibility to farmers. Yes, clearly they they are eligible to sign up for the PPP, and Bob Ray and Dale Latz did that in a previous webinar, so you can go back and listen to that. Right. You get a lot of information that's really good about uh, how to get yourself signed up. Farm Credit actually sent out a press release within moments of well, this passing, uh, the additional funding being passed last night. So uh, local lenders and Farm Credit are, are probably as good a place as any to get the answers to that question. Uh, I don't think I've asked this question yet. Why is it that China under the phase one deal or any other uh, deal has not bought US ethanol or will it? Well, we know it's on the purchase list. That's, that's what we do know. Uh, why they haven't made any purchases yet is uh, unbeknownst to us at this point. That's a good question. Do you have a sense of how severe the labor shortage or any restriction on labor movement will impact the ag sector? I would think that this would be important in processing plants of all types. Have we thought about that? I, and I, I, I guess I've been, I, my first thought when the university here on in Champaign-Urbana said stay home, uh, that that was a good decision for lots of ideas, in a large part because the largest processing plant, or one of the two largest processing food processing plants on the planet, is located in Champaign, Illinois, that belongs to uh, Kraft Heinz uh, by pounds. So it, it, it's interesting, I suppose, to think about. Um, yeah, it's, and it's going to depend by different sectors of the industry, right? Your your fresh fruit, fresh vegetable, and fruit crops are obviously very dependent on on seasonal labor um and there's you know I, you read different stories about the challenges there dairy too of course and then maybe even the most pressing at the moment is some of what's going on in these packing plants uh around the spread of covid and how that's going to impact their operating ability which will impact the supply chain so it's you know it's a big question that i think uh there, there's a lot of expertise being applied to try to sort those things out i believe uh, the, I see what appears to be the CRP cost through the CCC. Why would CRP payments be part of the CCC? Well, all the conservation programs are paid out of the CCC. So the funds of the CCC are used to pay not just the, the Title I payments and the marketing assistance loan uh, outlays, but CRP comes from that, as do the, there's a bar in there for a transfer to NRCS for the other conservation programs. So even EQIP uh, and, and the other programs are, are funded through that mechanism. This is an interesting question. Can you speak to the overlap of ARC PLC, uh, crop insurance, MFP, all the emergency payments covering the same losses? Aren't they just covering the same revenue losses? Well, we get that argument a lot and the technical answer is that your arc plc programs are made on base acres so you have that flexibility around farming uh, around what you plan on a base whereas crop insurance is covering losses uh, in the actual crop year from market and yield loss where again arc and plc are looking at sort of the longer term price uh, issues but you know, critics uh, have have pointed that out, and that's you know that that does add um, that does add a layer of challenge to sort of thinking through uh, some of these payment priorities. But, yeah, I mean, uh, we're we're in a we're in kind of an era where you know, I think pointing out the it's, it's easy in a in a stable price environment to point out the potential areas for overlapping coverage between the the commodity and, and crop insurance programs, but. 
you know, I mean, you know, looking ahead to like what, what we could see for next year, you know, for a crop insurance program, you know, we could very well be looking at a, you know, a 330, 340, 350 uh, price guarantee uh, for the 2021 crop, um, you know, compared with um, you know, much, much higher levels for their current year and, or in previous years. I mean, th those price adjustments and, and guarantees adjust very quickly to the market and it's specific to the year, whereas ARC and, ARC and PLC are kind of there to provide more stable, uh, in the case of uh, ARC, uh, rolling average coverage based on some previous years versus PLC that set um, price coverage. So, you know, there, there are some differences and, and they've, they've designed them in ways to try to reduce or minimize the, the amount of overlap between the programs. We're running in on the last two and a half minutes here. If any of you have gone through questions that are left there and you want them, want to answer them, go ahead uh, and drop those out. Uh, I do want to answer this question, though. Do any of you believe the ethanol producers will get assistance? I, <laughs> Brooke, I'll give you a minute on that and I'll, I'll sort of, <laughs> I, I think we have to, honestly. Um, I go back around to, what is it? Forty to forty-five percent of all the corn grown in this country goes through ethanol, and what another forty per forty-five percent go into the feed sector. So, right now, those two sectors are taking a massive hit. And I go back then again to the point I made about this is an important domestic production capacity and capability that we have um, in ethanol and biofuels. And if we had to retool, if we had to use it for something else, it would just. It just seems to me that that. It, this is not a, a time to even risk sacrificing the jobs that are involved. We don't need more people on unemployment, the income streams and the rural communities that are struggling and just the, the production capacity that it represents. So I got to believe we get, we get help out there. If not, that is just a serious, serious uh, missed opportunity to help. I think we've come to the yeah. end of our time. Go ahead, Brooke. No, I was just going to say, I do think that will be a big uh, part of the, 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 the debate for the next package. I, I think that, um, you know, already having conversations with, with our champions in Congress and, and others kind of looking at how we might be able to structure something in the next package to give, to give the direction to help the ethanol industry. So, and I couldn't have said, I mean, Jonathan laid out the point perfectly. So I, I'll just say ditto to, to everything you said. <laughs> Well, thank you so much to Brooke Appleton, who is the Vice President of Public Policy at the National Corn Growers Association. She's in Washington, D.C., along with Jonathan Coppice and Nick Paulson, both part of the Farm Doc team, members of the uh, College of Agricultural, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences here on the Urbana-Champaign campus of the University of Illinois. I'm Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. Also, thanks go to our technical director for the day. He's behind the scenes, Jim Baltz. Uh, be sure to fill out that survey as you exit, and we hope to talk with you again on Tuesday of next week for another Farm Doc Daily webinar. Have a good day.